Hi, my name is Matthew, and today I'm going to be presenting to you work that I did with uh, Santiago Rodriguez Papa and Charles Ofria at MSU in association with the Beacon Center. This work is really fundamentally characterized by interest in uh, the topic of major transitions um, in evolution and their relationship to open-ended evolution. Uh, major evolutionary transitions are evolutionary events where new self-replicating entities emerge. These are thought to be formative in natural history, uh, often associated with um, biological complexity and diversity. And they've been highlighted as a key theme of open-ended evolution in how they create continuing opportunities for the emergence of novelty. This work will focus uh, in on a specific type of major transition, fraternal transition, evolutionary events where kin unite to form a new self-replicating entity. Characteristic examples from biological history include the evolution of multicellularity, where kin cells come together to form a self-replicating multicell and the evolution, evolution of eusociality, um, often among insects where um, cooperating insect kin come together to form a self-replicating uh, colony. And in this work, we're looking at a case study of a lineage uh, drawn from a digital evolution simulation designed to study the evolution of multicellularity. In this case study, we'll be looking at how complexity, novelty, and adaptation arose over time. Um, but before we get to the case study, I'll give you kind of an outline of the model system that we're working with. Uh, so like many other digital evolution systems, this uh, model system tracks cells situated on a toroidal grid. These cells are controlled by genetic, uh, evolving genetic programs. And a key mechanism of this Simulation framework is the idea of a kin grouping, which I'll kind of explain to you here by example. So on the slide, I've got one live cell occupying a larger toroidal grid and um, cells can interact with and reproduce into neighboring tiles on this grid. Um, the kin grouping of this single cell is denoted in orange. Um, offspring can be placed into new kin groupings, um, here denoted by color. This purple cell has been ejected to start its own kin group. Um, however, when cells replicate, they can also elect to have their daughter cell grow the existing kin group. Um, and ultimately, these cells are competing for space, uh, limited space on a fixed size toroidal grid. Um, and in addition to uh, being able to recognize and respond to the uh, the kin groupings of cells around them. Um, we also kind of bake in some functional consequences of these kin groupings into the model uh, where we preferentially distribute resource to cells that are parts of larger kin groups in order to incentivize the formation and in order to ensure turnover uh, and opportunity for continued generation of kin groups. We remove old kin groups from the grid to make space. And in previous work, we've shown that um, these kind of approaches are sufficient to select for characteristic traits of multicellularity like resource sharing, uh, apoptosis, and reproductive division of labor. And so um, just a little bit about where we got the data from that we analyzed in this case study. We uh, started out with a toroidal grid uh, with 14,000 tiles. We seeded it with randomly generated ancestors and then we ran it for three hours of evolve time. Um, and then we serialized the population to file and then loaded it up for another um, subsequent three hour session. Uh, continuing onwards, we refer to each kind of three hour session as a stint. Um, and so the evolution is progressing um, stint upon stint, going from stint zero all the way up to stint 100, uh, just as a sense of scale. Uh, running with four threads, this was sufficient to observe about 20,000 cell generations over the course of the simulation. We performed uh, 40 replicates of this, um, uh, these evolutionary runs, and we selected the case study from one of them. All right, so now getting into the case study itself. 
So um, what we did is we pulled out a uh, specific run and looked at a, um, a lineage uh, where we observed qualitative morphological uh, novelty arising in, uh, in terms of how um, cells were actually organizing themselves into kin groups. So uh, we looked, we manually reviewed kind of video recordings of uh, different kin group phenotypes, and we organized them into uh, 10, 10 kind of uh, coded categories, uh, which we uh, refer to by letters. Um, however, uh, there's only a few that you kind of really need to get a sense for to understand the gist of this work. So I'll go ahead and review kind of the main events on this evolutionary lineage for you now. So at stint zero, we um, observed a, a unicellular morphology. Um, uh, what I've got on this video is a recording of the phenotype of um, this morph. Uh, you can see individual tiles within the grid represent cells and kin groups uh, represented by color are just the size of single cells. So these cells are kind of engaging in a unicellular strategy here. I refer to this as morph A. Uh, later on in evolution, we observed uh, the emergence of, uh, let's see, this video will play, there we go. Uh, larger uh, kin groupings uh, that had kind of a regular um, size and kind of a, a roughly um, symmetrical uh, shaping. Um, we refer to this particular morph as morph D. Um, at stint 15, along the evolutionary trajectory, uh, we observed a, a morphological novelty of how these multicellular groups were organizing themselves in that um, they're uh, they started to kind of form these really long, stringy uh, uh, multicellular groupings, uh, preferring to grow their groups out in the left-right direction. Uh, we refer to this as morph E. Finally, at stint 45, we observe another uh, morphological novelty where um, these kin groups were growing out in kind of the horizontal stringy fashion. However, as you'll see um, shortly, uh, they engage uh, right here in a secondary burst of growth in the vertical direction kind of later on in their life history. Uh, and they're using an apparent internal timing cue to decide uh, when to kind of perform this secondary round of growth. So, uh, Seeing these uh, novelties on the lineage that we were anal analyzing, we became curious about how kind of um, these novelties related to uh, adaptation and to complexity in, in the system. So first looking at adaptation, because in the system, fitness is implicit. We don't have an explicit fitness function that we can feed genomes into and get a, a um, uh, direct a reading out of kind of a, a numerical fitness. What we have to do is um, determine fitness in terms of competitions. And so what we did is we took populations and competed them against the population from uh, one stint before to kind of determine whether um, there was uh, uh, adaptation that allowed that uh, uh, population to outcompete its predecessor. And so um, in order to get statistical significance, we had to do a bunch of replicates of kind of each uh, stint wise comparison. But um, jumping into the data, um, what I have graphed here is these stint by stint fitness differentials on the y axis. On the x axis, um, we can see uh, time uh, measured in stints going from zero to 100. The color coding of the letters uh, refer to the qualitative morphological categories that we assigned. Um, and the first vertical line, the first dashed vertical line um, denotes where we first saw that uh, uh, asymmetrical elongated uh, morphology. And then uh, the second dashed line refers to where we first saw that um, secondary novelty with that kind of burst of secondary growth. And so, um, 
uh, we were able to, uh, using kind of other statistics, determine that there was evidence of adaptation in the stints where these two novelties emerged. Um, however, kind of what was interesting to us was that the uh, magnitude of the uh, change in fitness uh, during these stints where we observed kind of radical novelty um, was uh, kind of on par with the adaptation that we observed in stints where uh, there was uh, no kind of apparent um, uh, innovations. We also looked at measures of complexity. Uh, we took a sequence complexity measure after kind of the modes toolbox. Um, the idea being trying to count up how many sites in a genome are critical to fitness. So like if you think of a genome like a Jenga tower, we're looking to see how many blocks when you pull a single block out, it causes the tower to collapse. Trying to figure out how many sites are actually doing something with respect to the uh, functionally, trying to do something functionally. So here I've got sequence complexity on the y-axis. Again, we've got time on the x-axis and these morphs are color-coded um, and represented with letters. And we can see um, some features here, um, including discontinuity, um, jumps in sequence complexity, Interestingly, this first jump uh, wasn't associated with uh, qualitative novelty that uh, before and after the jump, it was still kind of coded as uh, morph B. Um, however, some jumps in sequence complexity were associated with uh, qualitative novelty, like going from morph B to morph D. And interestingly, we'll return to this later, but going from morph D to morph E, we saw a drop in sequence complexity. And at other times in the simulation, we saw a more gradual um, increase in sequence complexity as opposed to kind of um, discontinuous jumps. Uh, to complement the sequence complexity measure, we also came up with an interface complexity measure. The idea here is to try to, to quantify the richness of the interactions that these cells are having with their environment. In the simulation, there's three ways that cells can interact with their environment. First, they can send arbitrary messages to other cells. Um, they have a set number of simulation determined kind of output parameters that they can uh, control. Um, here in this analogy, it's kind of like a sound mixer board where you have a bunch of knobs and dials that you can twist and adjust. Um, they also have a, a series of um, simulation defined inputs that they can react to. Um, in this analogy, kind of like a dashboard where there's um, you know, knobs and uh, there's dials and kind of uh, indicator lights, um, a fixed number of these that you can um, interpret and make decisions based on. And so uh, we have these different ways of interacting with the environment. And the question is, how many distinct ways is DJ Genome here actually interacting with the environment in a way that's important for fitness? So I have um, some more details I can go into in the Q&A section here, but um, uh, what we have quantified on the y-axis here is this interface complexity measure. Um, how many distinct ways are these cells interacting with the environment? And the kind of the, the most interesting feature here is this discontinuous jump in interface complexity going from morph D to morph E, where we first saw the emergence of that um, asymmetrical kind of really elongated uh, kin grouping structure. Um, and what's really interesting is that um, this jump in interface complexity from DDE uh, is the opposite of what we saw when we measured sequence complexity, where we actually saw a discontinuous decline in sequence complexity. So we'll return to that um, in these next slides to talk about that a little bit more. All right, wrapping up here, because um, this is a case study, um, the takeaways here are more anecdotal in nature. However, we did see a kind of uh, appear to see a loose coupling between novelty, complexity, and adaptation, uh, where um, the uh, events that were associated with one of these uh, phenomena didn't necessarily imply um, association with the other phenomena. Um, and although novelty was sometimes adaptive, we didn't see evidence that these innovations led except uh, yielded exceptional fitness increases, which is a little bit surprising that you can have big morphological changes without having um, kind of anything other than run-of-the-mill changes in fitness. At times, uh, we also saw opposing signals from our different measures of complexity, which really underscores the importance of um, interpreting these, uh, interpreting complexity as kind of a multidimensional 
uh, phenomena and trying to bring in lots of different measures to put in conversation with each other. In future work, we're interested in fleshing out our uh, assay for adaptation. We were competing populations against each other in this work. However, we'd also be interested in competing kind of uh, representative individuals to see from the different stints to see if we see kind of the same uh, general pattern of adaptation um, and this different way of measuring uh, changes in fitness. We're also interested in developing uh, methodology to uh, quantify non-critical sequence complexity. So the idea being that um, right now, if there are genome sites that are important to fitness, but perhaps because of some kind of redundancy, uh, if you knock out one site, you don't see a, a decline in fitness. However, um, the site is contributing functionally somehow in conjunction with other sites. Uh, we'd be interested in kind of developing ways to detect that. Uh, we're also interested in investigating causal factors uh, potentially associated with open-endedness, such as um, sexual recombination and ecology, and seeing if um, adding these factors to the simulation if we can see changes in uh, adaptation, novelty, and complexity. Finally, um, one of the kind of uh, foundational um, aspects of our interest in this model is uh, kind of how it's a good fit for um, uh, computational scalability. Um, because all the aspects of simulation logic are in implemented in terms of um, interactions between adjacent cells in this grid um, and that these interactions in, uh, are robust to uh, perturbation or disruption. Um, it makes it a really good fit for kind of distributed best effort communication model, really inspired by some of the work by Dave Ackley on indefinite scalability. And with the existing system, uh, we've been able to achieve 80% efficiency, scaling it up to run on 64 nodes on our compute center at MSU. And we're really interested in some of the neuromorphic hardware that's coming down the line um, and uh, kind of being able to leverage the, uh, basically the uh, lattice of locally interconnected processing elements on this you know, massive hardware. The stuff that Cerebrus came out with recently has 850,000 cores. Um, being able to leverage that, uh, that architecture um, uh, due to kind of the, um, the structure of the simulation itself. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and collaborators, uh, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs>